Be sure to check out MythVisionPodcast.com. Help MythVision grow, guys. Become a Patreon member. You guys will get early access to all of my videos when I'm done editing them. Also, it's a small community where you guys can message me your questions and talk to me in private. You guys can donate also through PayPal. Join our social media links down in the description. We have Twitter and Facebook groups. Help the community of MythVision grow. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel. Hit that bell button so you're notified every time I do a live video and you don't miss any of my content. Like this video and comment your thoughts below because I want to know what you think about all of these things. We are myth vision welcome back to myth vision podcast ladies and gentlemen your host derek lambert i'm here to take you guys on a ride as usual learning new things just blowing your mind on information you never knew we're going to talk about early christianity or if you will jewish christianity maybe even get into some philo how this had influence on christianity i mean when's the last time you stood in church and heard the pastor say and by the way the platonic thought of philo of alexandria had influence on the jamesian sect as well as the pauline what no it was all god and specifically the revelation of God is the only thing that presented these truths to them as if there weren't components in that time that were utilized by these sects. And so I have Samuel Zenner today. And once again, joining us, thanks for joining me, brother. Yes, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Guys go down in the description as usual. You can help check out his stuff. Uh, academia.edu. He's written many articles, many books, if you will, a lot of information. Dr. Robert M. Price and other scholars, you know, contact him and ask him to find things for them because he's just always on the search and uh, constantly coming up with information. Our last episode we did, we talked briefly on Josephus and the testimony in Flavinium as it is <laughs> having a totally different meaning than what we've been told it means all this time. And today I figured we'd go into probably talking about these two guys right here. Let's see if you can see them. Uh, maybe we could start out here or do we need to start out with Philo? Where, where are we starting, Samuel? Um, actually, not Peter and Paul. It, uh, well, yeah, sure. But we have to include James in there. Okay. I got to find a James picture sometime. <laughs> But yeah, so talk, just start us out. I'd love to hear some of the information surrounding this. Um, I know that this isn't necessarily a historicity conversation, though you mentioned in the email uh, on our notes, you know, he is the brother of the Lord. And it's only mentioned in this phrase, in this exact context in Galatians 1, 9, brother of the Lord is the only New Testament use of this phrase. It's nowhere else. And then the plural is in 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Right. Yeah, so uh, I respect uh, people who, are, who have a different interpretation right, uh, of those passages. Um, I, I, I'm a scholar, so I, I don't get uh, excited right, about um, people disagreeing with my particular interpretation. That's fine. Right? Uh, but that, that is the case. The Galatians 1, 9, this is the only place uh, in the New Testament that has the phrase in the singular, right? Referring to a specific individual as the, the brother of the Lord. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, right? There's, that's the sole instance of this phrase uh, used in the plural. And in both instances, right? They're sort of grouped together uh, with apostles, uh, including Cephas, which I think is Peter. Uh, some would disagree, but uh, I think it is referring to, to Peter. Petros, the name, would have the same meaning in Greek as uh, kepha, right, in Aramaic. Right? The kepha, the, the S at the end is just a terminal uh, sigma in Greek. You know, it's a way to Greek size, right, make Greek uh, an Aramaic uh, word, right. Right? which is a, a rock or a crag. So uh, in, in any case, um, in Galatians 1 9, Paul writes about uh, James or Jacob, right? Uh, the brother, it refers to him as the brother of the Lord. It's in the accusative, so it's Jacob Bon, uh, right? Tona del Fon to cure you, right? So the Jacob, the brother of the Lord. And um, in any case, 
uh, I take this literally. I don't think that this is, well, it just could be, it just mean a fellow Christian uh, because this is such a singular, literally a singular use uh, of this phrase uh, with a reference to a specific individual. So if this is just a way to refer to someone who's a fellow believer, why isn't this term more frequently used in the New Testament? It's, it's only used here uh, and in 1 Corinthians 9, 5, uh, where there is the brothers of the Lord, which I would assume would be the, the, um, uh, the other brothers, including James, uh, including others, right, in, in, in the family. Of course, you know, you, you then devolve into speculation. It's like, well, who were the others? Because right. for those, we, we really don't have any names, right, in Paul, which according to, in my opinion, would be an early historical source, right, especially the, the letter to the Galatians. Um, so we, I would say that I know from, from there, we can talk about James, the brother of, of Jesus. Um, and there were other brothers, according to 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Tradition gives us names, but we can't be totally confident about those because those are later traditions in the Gospels right, and, and further into the second century of the Common Era. Um, in, in, in any case, um, where this story starts, of course, is in Galatians, where we see that there's a, a very bitter antagonism Right, uh, outright rivalry between Paul and James, uh, not only James, but the uh, J Jerusalem right, group of the, what we might call the Jesus sect or the Jesus uh, group, right? It's just uh, a Jewish group within Judaism, similar to, see, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Sadducees, um, and, um, well, in any case, we, we read in Galatians, right, well, so what was the rivalry about? Well, we see that it has to do with um, kashrut, right, with, with the Jewish dietary laws, right? It has to do with uh, the question of, uh, of circumcision, right? Uh, so the dietary laws, that has to do with the uh, debate, right, about uh, the Jewish and Gentile members of the Jesus movement eating together, right? So that's what Paul is, is, is talking about in Galatians 2, right? So the concern was uh, that, well, some of the food might not actually, uh, you know, be, be uh, kosher, right, following the kashrut dietary laws. So it's best to have the Jewish and the Gentile followers of the movement eat separately, right, uh, in Antioch, right? This probably wouldn't have, would, would not have, uh, be the case elsewhere. Uh, for instance, in, in the Jerusalem group, they probably just could have eaten together because uh, the authorities would have known, they, they could be confident the food at the mills, right, is kosher. So uh, everyone can, can eat of this, uh, so it's no problem. Now, um, the, the, the element of circumcision, um, this is a little uh, trickier because uh, we, we have to go to the book of Acts, right, which we cannot take uh, in a historical sense to the degree that we can the epistle to the Galatians. But in any case, according to Acts 15, the view of James was that, all right, if if pagans or Gentiles, they want to join this Jesus movement, they can do it. They don't need to be circumcised. That's actually uh, a standard, that'd be the standard rabbinic uh, view, right? Gentiles do not need to be circumcised. They not fear. Uh, to, be, not fear. to be quote unquote saved, right? To be all right with God. They don't need that. They don't even have to be God fearers, right? You just have to be a moral person, right? 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 But in, in any case, Right, the God fears, right? Uh, but um, uh, Bruce Charlton has pointed this out in, in his uh, studies of Acts 15. What James's uh, position was that, all right, you, of course they don't have to be circumcised to be part of this movement, but if you want to call yourself a Jew, right? And if you want to 
be saying that you are Israel, right? Then you need to be circumcised, right? So, right? So uh, this is sort of hit, uh, this is what Paul I think is is hitting back at in the Epistle of Galatians later on after chapter two, where it's well, chapter five and six, where he says that well, it's the real circumcision that's us, right? Meaning that's 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 the Gentiles, right? Uh, we're the real circumcision. We are what he calls the. It's a strange um, phrase that uh, we we don't find elsewhere. Because the Israel of God, um, whatever he meant by that. It seems to me that he would just be meaning, well, we're the real Israel. We're the true Israel. This anyway, so what James is saying is that, well, look, you know, if you're going to be calling yourself Israel, you need to be circumcised. In other words, James right. wants to preserve the diversity and the distinction between Jew and Gentile. May I ask a question here, Samuel? I'd, I'd like to prod and, and get your insight, and maybe you've never heard this before. There are sects of Christianity, Judaism, if you will, um, like the Black Hebrew Israelite movements, um, there are certain Hebrew Israelite type movements, right, and other theological groups that even aren't claiming to be lost tribes of Israel, who want to argue that Paul's Gentiles are not actually Joe Pagan over here, uh, uh, like uh, like the Roman Caesar, so to speak, uh, that these are actually some type of Hellenized. Um, Israelites that aren't Jews. And what they'll say is Jews are from Judah or the southern part of Israel, if you will. The, right, the so, so southern part of the kingdom. Right. And these guys will argue that the 10 lost tribe idea is the still alive. Tribe, the northern part of Israel. Even if you think it's still a mythos, right? They want to say that that this mythos is still alive in the documents of the New Testament and that these Gentiles are actually the lost tribes. Now, Dr. Jason Staples is writing books on this, and I hope to interview him at some point. He's in the scholarly world, student of Dr. Bart Ehrman, uh, been in email correspondence with him on trying to make a, a show happen. He wrote an article called A Fresh Look at the Gentiles in Romans 11. I just wanted to give you a little, I gotta give you something before I say what they believe, because it might go like, uh, and you just throw it off without considering it. I just want you to not to straw man them or poison the well. And what they say is that the fresh look at Gentiles in Romans 11 is that the fullness of the Gentiles, first they're waiting on the fullness of the Gentiles, then all Israel will be saved. And so the, the idea is what does the fullness of the Gentiles have to do with all Israel? They believe that this is a reference to the lost tribes where God talks about regathering Israel, his the bride that, that was lost and had been scattered among the nations. And therefore, Paul's trying to bring in these Gentiles. I didn't want to spend the whole show on this. I just wanted to throw this out there and get your thoughts. Uh, because from what I understand in talking to Dr. Price and other scholars in the field, we have historical evidence, even apart from the mythos of the New Testament and books like Acts, to prove that God fears were practicing Judaism, going to synagogues that were not Israelites. These were your Joe Pagan who was fascinated with monotheism and, and the God of Israel. And so from a distance, they could come. They didn't have to be circumcised. They didn't have to participate in dietary laws or anything like that. And they could worship the God of Israel from a distance. And so I think, and they go, these some of these groups go to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and say, Cornelius was an Israelite. Some of their arguments, you, you may not have heard their arguments of, uh, this might be poisoning the well a little since you haven't read some of the material. I'd love to have you read some of their ideas, but um, they want to say, well, nobody could receive the Holy Spirit. As far as we know, in the biblical context, the only people who had the Holy Spirit were Israelites. So why is it that these non-Israelites are getting the Holy Spirit? And I like to say, because something new is happening here, but you know, that well, can be it, with Paul. Paul's doing something different is what I'm trying to get at. Like, the fact that by and, and Paul, uh, you know, is, is good at, at appropriating passages uh, from the various portions of the Tanakh, right, in order to bolster his program. I, I mean, one immediately thinks of the, the book of the 12, the 12 so called minor prophets, Joel, right, he foretells the time when God will uh, pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Mm -hmm. So just not Israel, but all, all humanity, right? All mortals, right? And uh, 
you know, uh, uh, later Isaiah also right, talks about um, the, uh, the nations, the Goyim, right? The, the, the nations, the Gentiles, right? And these, at least there, are, are, are a separate group from Israel. From the exiled uh, Jews, also the, the exiled northern Israelites. Uh, so there is, is a distinction. Now, uh, so that's somewhat of a separate question, though, because yeah. what, what did Paul think in his own mind, right, is, is a different uh, question, right? And um, there, uh, you can start approaching it by keeping in mind uh, another one of the minor prophets, uh, Hosea. He has a, a very famous prophecy, right? where the Northern tribes are told that, well, you're no longer children of God, right? But a time will come when you will be called the sons of the living God, children right. of the living God. So you'll be brought back. Now, Paul quotes this verse, right? In Romans nine, I believe, towards the end. But he says that this refers, this is a prophecy of the conversion of the, the Gentiles, right, right, who are in, who are being contrasted with Israel. Exactly. Yeah. So you would think, yeah, he's, he's talking about the Goyim, right? So you would, you either have to think that he's t t uh, misinterpreting out of ignorance, or he's deliberately misinterpreting Hosea. Hosea is a prop. This is a prophecy about the ten northern tribes being reconciled to God, not about uh, the, the Gentiles. Right, so there's that issue. What what Paul may have thought uh, in his own mind, right? So um, yeah, so just for anybody about, wondering though, that reference is Romans nine thirty through thirty one. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith, which is you look at Galatians three things like that. But that but the conjunction there in the Greek is but that Israel. So you have that Gentiles. Oh, but that Israel separating the Gentiles here from the Israelites, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. So just like figure I'd give the reference there and let people kind of consider uh, Romans 9, 30 through the 1. Neither can we expect Paul to be a systematic theologian. We can't, ex we can't expect right, that he had worked out uh, all of his beliefs into a coherent system. So there can be uh, some uh, contradictions uh, between his his thoughts in the, in different passages of his writings. He, he was not a systematic theologian. He was creating uh, a new theology, and we cannot impose a system upon that. Right. So I appreciate you taking the time to. Yeah. yeah. Right, so. Uh, in Romans four, for instance, right, he, he he then quotes from Genesis about Abraham, the prophecy about Abraham uh, becoming a father of many nations. And to me, it seems that Paul actually it, it seems to me that the way he he's hinting there is that all right, um, these Gentiles, right, the Gentiles are the, the many nations. That are descended from Abraham, right? So I mean, you can ask, well, is that correct or not? That's one question, but uh, the real question really is, well, you know, what does Paul think? What is Paul thinking there? Mm -hmm. All right, and that's the task of uh, of exegesis. And of course, there's going to be different opinions, but in my view, it really does. Uh, the The question presents itself to me: Is Paul here implying right, that even the Gentiles are actually descendants of Abraham. Uh, and, but that does not mean that he would have worked out all of the consequences of that belief. He could have been inconsistent uh, in working out his theology. That's and actually one of the things these, these guys will say Occam's razor, right? And they'll go, well, look, perfect example. The promise is to Abraham. Now, of course, they stand on the Old Testament claiming and the, the New Testament is kind of really trying to actually fulfill what that said. But, for example, you will become the father of many nations. If you were to look standing just based off of that text in the Genesis account, 
one might conclude he literally will father in a literal biological descendant type, you know, the seed of Abraham. He will be an actual biological father of many nations. And it's proven in the context to some degree that like uh, Jacob and Esau, like various, uh, the Edomites and the different, you know, ites that are out there is the Israelites and all the ites and di different nations, right? In the context there. But um, the guys who have this theological cool position will say Occam's razor to them is Paul simply is riff, riffing off the same thing because his Gentiles, he believed in his mind, were actual descendants of Abraham. This is how they will argue in a literal sense. So I've never seen this theory in mainstream like critical scholarship, like tackle this theory. It's never made it into it because I think that they all just accept unanimously Gentiles are this thing other than anything descendant of Abraham in a literal sense. These guys are saying, you're missing the mark. All critical scholarship has missed the mark. All Everyone who's looked at these texts, Bart Ehrman, you name it, doesn't, doesn't matter. They miss the context. They miss the point. Paul thinks these are real Israelites in some real literal sense. And so they, they do different things, in my opinion, gymnastics, to find a way to say, well, these are paganized Israelites. They go to the Maccabees. They try to say, during the Maccabean times, um, you know, Israel, northern Israelites, they, they say still existed among the nations, decided to stop circumcising. So now by the time you get to the, the first century, you have these Israelites that aren't circumcised or not practicing dietary laws and all these type of things. And here you have Paul simply saying, you know what, let's break down the wall of separation between our brothers and sisters who are also Israelites, Hosea. Uh, they are no longer a people and bring this unity. Don't worry. The end is about to happen any moment now. Don't worry about getting circumcised. Don't worry about dietary laws. Just come as you are like a Baptist preacher in the 21st century. Uh, dress how you want to dress and come as you are and come on in. And this is how they're viewing it. Sorry. I well, you can't, there, there is a certain amount of confusion that, that can creep in here because in Hebrew, you know, can you? speak of in the prophets especially when they speak of the goyim right the, the the gentiles with that term but uh but there's also uh um, um, in, which is uh literally people and in the plural peoples which also can be rendered nations but this can be applied to israel just as much as to so-called gentiles right so there can be confusion there where you have prophecies about uh, they were flowing in from the nations uh, this could be referring to uh, return of, of uh, uh, Jews, right, from exile, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's easy, right, to uh, exploit uh, those types of texts, right, uh, and to probably overlook, right, that the, many times there in the Hebrew, it's not, it's not the goyim, right, it's the, na it's the peoples, right, which is much, which is ambiguous, mm -hmm. right? Because the people of Israel are a people, the nation of Israel, right? So, yeah, but they're a singular. This is where it starts getting the technical stuff that none of the guys that I'm talking about in this particular view um, know Greek or Hebrew like that. They they have to refer to this the scholars, and all the scholars tell me goyim being plural, uh, eth ethne plural. Um, th this in its own definition and right expands beyond the singular which is israel look um israel is a holy goy oh singular got it it's a holy nation it's not a holy nations israel is not nations it is a nation and therefore um this is kind of getting off track but anyway it, it's just a fascinating topic maybe i can get you more information on it but it's in the vein of what we're going to be talking about in a sense not necessarily um between these rival these rivalry groups and Paul coming on saying Gentiles don't need to pr practice these things. What's the point? If there's no problem with the – look, we've already admitted it. Now they're trying to claim well, to be I, equal or – Yeah, despite what Paul may have thought in his own mind, I don't think that, that this idea was really operative right on a practical level uh, back then because his whole uh, – his uh, bigger paradigm is that, well, the Gentiles right, are, are spiritual – Jews, they're spiritual Israelites. So if he thinks that they're actual 
Israel, paganized Israelites from long ago. Uh, why call them only Israel in a spiritual sense? Is this, uh, it makes no, I agree. I think that the consensus on this opinion is accurate in terms uh, of. And, and, and as, as far as um, other uh, scholarship, uh, uh, you know, ac academic scholarship on some of these topics, uh, also, the, the, uh, one has to be aware, in my humble opinion, right? Um, you, you have to keep the historical context, for instance, of you know, the new Pauline thought. Right, that, that's become so predominant in, in recent decades. Uh, now it's morphed into, you know, the, the quote unquote, Paul within Judaism, right, school of thought. You, you have to go back to uh, uh, the, the Holocaust to set all of this in historical context, all right? You have the Holocaust. And after that, then, right, is uh, really the, uh, the birth of ecumenism. Right? And so now what we have two movements that we have to be particularly sensitive to, respectful of, but we also have to put them within the historical context uh, in, in, a, in a critical way. What happened? Christians, some Christians uh, then became very interested in the Jewish origins right, of Christianity for the purpose, not all, right? but some did this, for the, consciously or unconsciously, right? it varied depending on the individual. But after the Holocaust, right, uh, many Christians, the psychology almost demanded, right, well, we need evidence, right, that the New Testament is really not anywhere. Is it anti-Judaic or anti-Semitic, right? So we have to sanitize it. Uh, and there's, that can, that, there was a noble reason for, for that. And that is, all right, uh, let's say that there are anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic elements in the New Testament. Well, as Christian theologians, what we have to do and liturgists is we have to sort of re repackage that, change the wording, and give arguments to the people in the pew, in the pews, right? Well, see, the, the, John, the Gospel of John says they're sons of the devil. But see, you have to put it in historical context. He's not really saying that the Jews, all Jews are of the devil, right? He's only saying that a particular number of Jews who, uh, you know, were not good Jews to begin with were sons of the devil, right? So you make specious arguments, right? They're really don't hold water. But you do it for a good reason because you want to, you want to try to stamp out the idea that there's any justification or basis for anti-Semitism, anti-Judaism in the New Testament in, in the minds of, and hearts of Christians in the pews. But the, the problem that begins to emerge then immediately is that, well, wh what about historical accuracy? What if there, what if there are anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic elements in the New Testament? Truth demands Right, the, 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 that be acknowledged. So it's a, it's a difficult uh, tension that's created um, because you know the Christian in the pews, most of them are, are believe, well, well, the, the New Testament is inspired by God, right? So, right. Uh, but in their mind, fortunately in their mind, they now think, well, then there can't be anything anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic in there because, because anti-Semitism is deplorable. Right. 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 So that's good on a pastoral level. But the fact is that uh, there, there are anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic uh, aspects to the New Testament. And the historian has to grapple with that. Right. Uh, so there, there's the, the historian's uh, search for the for for truth. And then there's the pastoral strategies for trying to um, decrease and stamp out anti jews traditional Christian anti-Semitism in the minds of those in the, in the pews, right? Now, at the same time this was happening, right, there was a movement also among Jews, right, to say that, uh, to sort of back that, that strategy up, because after the Holocaust, uh, you know, we, we need to do everything we can do to avoid a repeat of the Holocaust in the future. Right. And so now you begin to read uh, scholars who's Jewish scholars pointing out, well, look how very Jewish the Gospels are, for instance, and Paul, how very Jewish 
uh, is uh, his uh, approach, right? And so, but the problem there is a lot of these uh, rabbinic parallels, for instance, uh, and other parallels that were drawn uh, don't always uh, hold up to closer scrutiny, right? And so, so for, for noble reasons, right, you had uh, an ecumenical outreach from, from a lot of Jewish scholars that, that sort of gave a stamp of approval to this whole new way of thinking about Paul as Paul within Judaism. Right. Right? And so, right. So a lot of Jewish scholars today will tell you, well, no, John is not anti-Jewish. He's not, the gospel of John is not anti-Jewish. What is uh, your anti-Semitic. opinion? I mean, Daniel you know- Boyari will tell you that. But there are other just as respectable uh, New Testament scholars, Jewish New Testament scholars, who, who uh, argue just the, the exact opposite. No, it's it's anti-Jewish. Let me ask you this: What is your opinion? Do you think he's anti-Jewish to some degree? I mean, do you, I've I've got guys who want to come on the show, and I do want to. Inter- I'm going to interview people, of course, on this topic as time goes by, and I can meet more scholars. Paul within Judaism. I mean, I wish I could get Paula Fredrickson on. She wrote um, uh, Paul the Pagan as Apostle. Yeah, and I'd like to get their opinions. But do you think that the new school of Paul within Judaism um, is a reaction? Instead of like, uh, yes, yes, it's a reaction. It started with Christians, as I said, after the Holocaust, wanting to save the reputation of Christianity in a post Holocaust world. It started so, with that. So, technically, it's not, not saying that there's not honorable intentions, of course, like you said, but if we're going to be accurate, how do you take Paul? Because that's really what we're talking about today. You're going to be presenting the. Uh, there have been some good insights that come uh, that came from the new right way of thinking about Paul. Uh, I don't think anyone's going to deny that. But I think, uh, as with a lot of corrections that come, uh, it's been exaggerated. It's, it's gone too far, right? And now there's a need, right, to restore some balance, right, and. Um, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, personally, in the, in the literature uh, that I've read, right, it's just uh, the, the arguments uh, don't stand up to scrutiny. And a lot of the main arguments uh, that have been proposed by, you know, like Paula Fredericks and, uh, and other uh, scholars like this, uh, even a uh, respected scholar like John J. Collins, right, um, has, a, has a fine chapter in one of his recent books, right, um, Really pointing out point by point where this new approach to Paul is just mostly in error. So, uh, I mean, it, it, we're, we're talking about different scholarly opinions. So, uh, you know, these there's never going to be total agreement on this. But if you ask my opinion, uh, that's it. Uh, there, um, most of the arguments that are proposed uh, do will not stand up to scrutiny. And um, for so instance, it- <laughs> when, when Paul says, when Paul says, um, uh, you know, no, uh, no flesh, right, is justified by the law and something like this in the Greek, no flesh, he's talking about no mortals. But uh, Paula Fredrickson says, that, well, that only means Gentiles. But it, it's a little preposterous. He says no flesh, no mortals, right? But, you know, it's, uh, uh, so they're not, it's not that they're not being honest with the text. I don't think they actually can let the text as it is register in their consciousness. Can I, can I be devil's advocate? I want to be dissonance, the cognitive dissonance perhaps, but, the, uh, and the, and the reasons they're making these, uh, arguments are noble. Right, right. That's what I wanted to bring up, Samuel, if you don't mind. Uh, One of the things that they'll say, and Paula Fredrickson says, I think something like this, please don't take this to the bank. Maybe I shouldn't even be using her name for this, but you can get the gist. And this goes in in line with those guys I was telling you about that think Paul's Gentiles, maybe Israelites, is that the law was only given to Israel. And so the way that I've heard the, 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 the idea is that why would the Gentiles need the law, right? If it's no mortal, well, Gentiles weren't given the law. Only Israelites or Israel was given the law. The Jews had the law. Um, the Gentiles didn't need the law. 
according to Paul. And so there, she's trying to say, look, uh, almost like she says, circumcision. And there's another gentleman that I'm actually friends with, Matthew Thesson. I think I'm pronouncing that correct. He wrote a, a couple books on the topic, but he also did an interview that was um, hosted in Yale or something, where he says that pretty much a Gentile could never literally, and there are certain sects of Judaism, that a Gentile could never literally become Jew anyway. And that they think Paul's mentality is, and, and, and they're reading into Paul's mind, that Paul is a thinking Jew that says, they can't really become I an know, Israelite. They're turning them into a Qumranite, basically. Which right. I think is, which is, I think so, is preposterous. But, but you can see how their thinking would lead go, that way. This is where they, this is the depth, uh, you know, uh, of unsust unsustainability where they have to go, right? All out of no, noble uh, motives. Right. right. But uh, noble motives is one thing, pastoral strategy is one thing, but uh, trying to get to a historical sense of an ancient text uh, can be quite a different affair. Yeah, I, I'm with you 100%. I think um, uh, when it comes to the laws, one of the hesitations I have is that, well, so we're in a Hellenistic age in the first century, and you're telling me the restrictions of anyone practicing Torah is only genetic, uh, biological, or you had to be a kin in some sense, uh, or it's you have no... Oh, see, the problem, the problem arose from this, look, uh, and John J. Collins points this out uh, in, 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 a, in a recent monograph, right? Paul, the problem was, right, sure, uh, the, the James movement, like in Acts 15, you can see there, James is like, all right, if people want to join the Jesus movement, which is a Jewish movement for, for James, right? According to James, it's the way he's thinking. They want to join this movement. That's fine. They don't need to be circumcised, right? They just keep the Noahide laws, so the laws of Noah, right? Is the basic, right? Handful of, of laws that right. are mostly parallel in rabbinic literature, right? That's all they. That's all they have to do. But uh, what Paul was teaching was that no flesh. That is. Gentile or neither Jew nor Gentile will be justified by the Torah. So in other words, Jews do not need to keep Torah anymore. That's mm. basically what he's saying, to put it bluntly, right? Now he makes a lot of, uh, of apparent qualifications of that, but it's only for the sake of rhetoric. And it's interesting, most of these right, confusing statements that he makes that he seems to be saying two different things, are mostly concentrated in the epistle to the Romans. But this is rhetorical, right? Because he had to placate, right? The, the Jewish uh, constituency in the Roman quote unquote church, right? And so he, he can't be as direct as he was in Galatians, for instance, because he's preparing his way to go to Jerusalem with that famous collection, right? And so he he's, uh, that's why his, quote unquote gospel is slightly different in the epistle, uh, in the letter to the Romans, right? So uh, oh, uh, by saying this, am I saying that, uh, you know, uh, we take the authority of, we, we're abrogating the law? By no means, but he actually is abrogating the law, right? And, um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, well, in any case, that, that was the issue, right, in the early church, right, um, uh, between James uh, and, and Peter, right, uh, on one hand, uh, and Paul on the other. And uh, when the book of Acts uh, has this uh, exchange between Paul and James, James tells Paul, well, look, a lot of the brethren are, are saying that you're teaching apostasy, right, in their over there in Asia Minor, telling them they, you know, they don't need to circumcise their children anymore uh, or keep the law of Moses. Uh, any honest reading right, of Galatians, for instance, I think will bear that out. It's like, actually, that's what he was doing. Right? Because no flesh, no mortal is going to be justified by the Torah. That's no, no Jew, no Gentile. Right? And, um... This begs the question, Sam, if you don't mind me asking, because I was listening to a wonderful lecture by Dr. Christine Hayes, and she did uh, a divine divine law um, uh, discussion going into how the rabbis, um, how Torah, and then, of course, how Paul thought. And she mentions um, Stoicism. 
I know she, she gets into platonic uh, thought, of course, as well. But Stoicism, I believe, was one of the things she mentioned. But ultimately, there was this idea that Paul does not believe the letter of the law, the writing of a law, just like the Greeks had this similar idea that it's not – what you want is a philosopher. The way the Greeks looked at it is like have a noble man who helps to teach and lead the people, not a written letter. The writing of the law isn't sufficient. It's good. It's secondary. It's not like it's bad in itself, but it doesn't – it's not going to do what, what – um, he thought and so he had a different stoic i thought i believe and maybe this goes into your philo connection i don't i'm not sure but paul has a stoic uh a particular no, i don't want to generalize about the stoics either but paul has a particular stoic understanding of law the namas right uh which doesn't square with with jewish tradition it just simply doesn't second temple jewish traditions uh in this instance right? he, he, is, is that it's the natural law is superior to the laws of nations. Right? Right. This is a, a stoic trope, right? And he appropriates various uh, uh, Tanakh uh, passages in order to read this stoic understanding of law into the Tanakh. It's, it's, it's really not there, right? And because uh, at, at the same time, there were uh, different Stoic uh, understandings of law uh, that, that uh, are more pleromatic, if you will, that are more augmented uh, th than that. And they don't necessarily have a, a negative view of cultural written laws or national laws. Right? Because uh, if you look at Philo of Alexandria, right, he's a Jew who has assimilated various Stoic uh, ideas and his idea uh, of uh, of law is that the natural law, which is what Stoics like to talk about, the natural law is somehow uh, uh, identical to the Torah of Moses, to the law of Moses. They're not right. in contradiction, right? And the uh, uh, in any case, it also has to do with a particular understanding. Uh, let's say. Uh, of soma versus numa, body versus, or or suke, is, uh, right? The the body versus the soul, matter versus immateriality, right? In, in the Platonic framework that Stoicism is is operating from, right? So right, unwritten law is the spirit, right? And the written law is the body, right? right. The body decay and pass away, da, 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 da. but uh, see, this is sto good Stoic thought, good Platonic thought, but it's, it's certainly not traditional Jewish thought, right? Um, uh, the, uh, the, for instance, when, when the prophets talk about the, the, the Torah, there will be a new uh, co uh, covenant, a new agreement, right? This is always talking about a, a renewal uh, of the Sinai Torah, of the Mosaic Torah, Right? Not, not an abrogation of it and a replacement of it with something else, some messianic uh, Torah. No, uh, it, it's a renewal of the, the covenant uh, right? the, that's already in place. Uh, and in, 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 in any case, uh, for those who subscribe to the new Pauline way, uh, Pauline schools of thought, right? And the Paul within Judaism, you have to ask yourself one fundamental question. So the basic one of the basic arguments is this, is that, well, Paul, sure, he, he says a lot of negative things about the law, but that's because he's writing to Gentiles. Yeah, that's that what they do. That makes no sense. That's, that makes no sense. What kind of argument is that? All, all right. The, 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 how you shoot that down is very easy, right? Half of Philo's works were written to whom? To pagans. They're written uh, after his, his mission to Rome. And so we have hundreds, if not thousands of pages from him. They're written to Gentiles. And there is not one sentence anywhere in those that can, can be misinterpreted as being negative, saying anything negative about the Torah. It's all clearly positive. Everything said about Moses, everything said about the law is positive. There's no possibility that he could be misinterpreted. So you got to ask yourself, uh, and he's writing to Gentiles, 
Now, his, his allegorical commentaries on the Torah, you know, those are written for, for uh, Jewish students of his, but his big, uh, famous treatises, like on the life of Moses and uh, the migration of Abraham, all of these, every good man is free, those were all written for Greco-pagan audience. If I may. And he talks principally about the Torah and about Moses, about Judaism, and it's all positive, nothing negative. So what, what, So why does Paul have to be negative at all? Uh, when, when uh, talking about the Torah, just because he's writing the Gentiles. No, it's because he's writing the Gentiles that he should go out of his way to avoid any uh, misinterpretation and, and to always be positive. That he is not is, uh, you know, lets the cat out of the bag, in my opinion. That's really a huge red flag because one of the things I had questions for um, Dr. Fredrickson uh, she had a symposium that I wasn't able to, I was going to write up a long thing with questions and like compliments and things that I thought were interesting about the book. Uh, there was no adding to the symposium. I've tried to email her. She's super busy to have her come on for the show. And I'm interested in having her come on in the future. But she said in her book exactly what you practically did. And she kind of argued that Paul's motives for speaking negative about the law was to Gentiles because he didn't want his Gentiles to fall astray and become Jews. He, he wanted his Gentiles to remain the nations and not to become Israel in the literal sense. And this was her argument is that he's talking down about the law, not because he believes the law is like, you know, he knows that it's no good for them, uh, which starts with other presuppositions. She believes she builds off of to make the case. And then says uh, at the end, you know, Paul doesn't really think this about the law. Uh, Paul actually thinks the law is great, but for the for these Gentiles, he doesn't want them getting led astray. And Paul's opponents were trying to convert Paul's people by saying, you need to get circumcised, you need to obey Torah, blah, 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 blah. And so he's only speaking down about it. So like, like in a way, psychologically to trick them to not follow the Torah and to keep in his sect. That was like a whole argument that Dr. Price was saying, uh, how do you know this? You got to ask, well, what's the problem? If, the, if some of these Gentiles want to become full converts, why not? Right. Why not? Paul would be opposed to it. But, but why not? Well, it's, it's not, it, it's, this is simply... Uh, one of the reasons, one of the core reasons why there was such bitter conflict between Paul and James and the Jerusalem authorities. Mm -hmm. And if it was over something, so, uh, it, it doesn't make sense that it was. It Especially if he's within Judaism. Because for right. decades, because this went on, this, this rivalry went on for decades. You would think that, well, can, it, can this be clarified? in some way and explained, uh, it, you know, after decades, you're still going to have uh, everyone still misunderstanding what Paul's really saying. Uh, no, the, the, the rivalry between James and, the, uh, and Paul uh, endured to the, to the end, right? Um, it was a real conflict. It was a real uh, bitter uh, disagreement, right? I agree. Uh, and and you know, Paul, Paul calls these uh, opponents, and he's, and he's, he's uh, not all scholars will admit this. Some of them, again, it's maybe cognitive uh, dissonance, right, uh, or theological bias, but uh, many scholars will not, they don't want to admit to themselves that when Paul is talking about all oh, those super apostles, they're, they're ministers of Satan, right? He's talking about James, Peter, uh, okay, for, uh, you know, all of these people there in Jerusalem, those who actually, right, at least in my viewpoint, would have known uh, Jesus, right? So, um, you know, this was a bitter rivalry, and, uh, you know, which, which was devolved uh, into name calling, at least on uh, Paul's side, right? Um, uh, but you see, um, Right, so if you, to go back to Galatians, when we see this, when Paul is writing about the conflict that he has with James, he says, look, I went to Jerusalem, right? And I concluded a deal with these, they shook my hand. It's like, all right, we'll minister to Jews and you'll minister uh, uh, to, to the Gentiles, right? And uh, with your gospel that you preach. And they say they agreed with me, they, they, give, they gave me their hands, right? 
But you have to understand, uh, Philip Esler has written on this, right? He explains uh, that, right, the, they were following the Mediterranean honor code, right? When you, when someone, when, a, when an inferior approaches an, a superior, the superior uh, can, uh, can basically, what, what some people might think of as lying. They can basically say something that is really not what they mean in order just to brush this person off uh, or to deal with it at a later time. So what's happening there is Paul uh, is being considered an inferior to James and the, the three in Jerusalem. And so the agreement that they gave was not an endorsement of Paul and his preaching, the way he presents it in, in Galatians, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, this was one of those Mediterranean, one of the instances of how the Mediterranean honor code works, right? So, all right, let's shake hands, right? And, and you move on, go on your way. And now after he's gone, now we're going to deal with this problem of Paul and his message. And then for the rest of Paul's ministry, you see them dealing with it. They're going to his churches and trying to uh, uh, clean up the damage from their viewpoint, right? Uh, it's the same thing think in the Gospel Paul's... of John. In the Gospel of John, uh, the brothers of Jesus ask Jesus if he's going to the festival in Jerusalem. And he says no. And then the next verse says, and then Jesus went to the festival. What did he, do? Right. he was brushing them off. He was basically telling them what looks like a lie because they're, they're, they're being portrayed as his inferiors and he, they don't have a right to impose upon him. Right? So, of course, Paul interprets this as, wow, I had an agreement with them. So he's thinking of himself as their equal. He doesn't realize uh, that in their viewpoint, he was an inferior. They were just basically brushing him off. And uh, right. And so he calls it, uh, I was betrayed, the act of treason. But, that it, but you know, if you keep in mind uh, the Mediterranean honor code, you understand what was going on there. They never did endorse uh, his mission right? and, and his way of teaching. Wow. So they, that was what I was going to ask you. And I guess you, you've really answered it, I guess, to comment on that is ultimately Paul felt betrayed and played, whether he's being honest or not in Galatians, I think he's being honest in some sense, if you take oh what God. you're suggesting, but if he's, let's just say they didn't, let's just say they, they brushed him off, but they didn't really give him an endorsement. And he went out saying they did. That's another possibility. Well, of himself and didn't realize he did not think of himself as their inferior he thought of himself probably not even as their equal he probably thought he was their superior mm. that's it that's his basic uh, attitude in his yeah because he he pretty much you know, does give that whole in a vision i'm his special apostle and uh you know it's like this this explains uh you know what you see in the four gospels for instance the four gospels to a large extent Right, uh, uh, to, to, to a certain extent, they're taking Paul's uh, letters, teachings from Paul's letters, even sometimes even sayings, and then they put them into Jesus' mouth in the four Gospels. So, so the Gospels are presenting a Jesus who is basically teaching Pauline doctrine. What about Matthew, though? What about Matthew? Matthew seems Matthew, quite contrarian. Matthew is touted as the quote unquote Jewish Christian gospel, but hold on a minute, right? With Mark, for instance, right? Uh, right, The rich young man asked, asked Jesus, what's the greatest mitzvah? What's the greatest commandment in the Torah? And then he calls the Shema Yisrael, right? Here, you know, Shema Yisrael, Adonai, you know, Adonai Echad, right? Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, etc. cetera. Um, that's the first and greatest commandment, right? Well, if you go to Matthew in that same pericope, Right? Someone comes up to Jesus and asks, what's the greatest commandment? Matthew leaves out Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, uh, our, our, the Lord your God, the, the Lord is one. He cuts it out. Hmm. And he starts with, oh, you love the Lord your God with all your heart. So he takes the Shema out. He takes the whole monotheism out. Right? Uh, this, this, and this is the so-called Jewish Christian gospel. All right? So, uh, he, so he takes Israel out of it, right? Hero Israel, uh, the monotheism, he, 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 he takes it out, right? And it also, it's very bitter. Like, for instance, Matthew 23 is this long screed against, you know, the, the, the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And it's like, well, what happened about loving your enemies? In uh, any case, uh, 
there are a lot of scholars, like even Esler, whom I mentioned earlier, I have a lot of respect for his work, but on that particular Matthew 23, he says, well, this is an inner Jewish criticism. But uh, again, I would say, uh, all you have to do is look at Philo. Philo in many places condemns eloquently, he condemns uh, hypocritical Jews. But there's never uh, anywhere when he does this where, where it could uh, uh, ever be misinterpreted as, a, as an attack, right, on, on uh, Jews or Jewish traditions, right? It has a, a totally different feel. You, there's no mistaking, right, um, uh, his, his uh, no one would, would be able to misinterpret Philo's denunciations of some Jews' hypocrisy. It's clearly a Jew criticizing other Jews. But you can misinterpret Matthew 23's long screed uh, against the Pharisees as anti-Jewish. Uh, again, it, well, it, that 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 brings up a point, though, um, when you look and consider dating of Matthew, which is important, I think, in light of uh, some scholars that are not even like as radical as some of the guys I bring on my show, where they point out replacement theology. And it's and the crazy thing is, it's not that it shows up once or twice. It's like they say when you see the, the mountain. Huh? It's the program of his gospel. It leads up to it bit by bit. Yes, and it, and there's so much evidence building up this case of replacing the nation of Israel for a new nation, a people um, that is consistent of anyone. This is opening up the door. But um, I wanted to bring up a interesting point you brought up that Jews, and this is the Jewish gospel. Jews is often a cipher sometimes for Jewish Christian. Well, yeah, yeah. Sorry. That that doesn't mean in this particular place here, you, the context is kind of almost difficult to find uh, in some spots, but people sometimes in the Paul and Judaism school might just think Judaism like a normal Jew, and, and this sect is radically different than your typical Judaism, or at least what was commonly understood as Pharisee and Sadducee and such that was going on during these days, but when, can you give us some uh, information on that? The Jews often cipher for Jewish Christian, right? Right. So if, if you see that in the in the four Gospels, uh, Jesus is basically preaching Pauline doctrine, and often in the very words of Paul, right? Often in the very words of Paul from his epistles, right? It was put into the, the, the mouth of Jesus. Um, then yes, the his his Jewish opponents. Right, uh, would be Paul's opponents, which are not only Jews who do not belong to the Jesus movement, but also Jews who do belong to the, the Jesus movement. And this also is why I think, right, in, in, in the Gospels, where uh, Jesus is always criticizing his, his disciples, his followers, uh, as being ignorant. They can't understand anything. They're rebellious. They betray him. This is sort of, uh, I think Hayim Maccabee pointed this out long ago in one of his books. That, uh, this is sort of a cipher. All oh, there, they're saying, well, yeah, those apostles that are, that are being belittled in the Gospels, who are those? Those are the apostles who are in charge of the Jesus movement in Jerusalem uh, at the time of Paul. Right? And um, but, but that's not all, right? There's this Pauline, uh, elements of the Pauline uh, corpus right, are used to construct uh, words uh, and, and sayings of Jesus, right? But th there's also more, right? Some, uh, Jose uh, some elements from Josephus are put in there, but also from Philo, right? And that's what's very interesting. Uh, I know uh, Rabbi Herbert uh, Basser in uh, Brio published his Commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, right, which is uh, uh, full of. Who, who is it? Uh, uh, Herbert Basser, B A S S E R, right? And uh, he writes in there, for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Well, you know, if you remember offends you, cut it off, right? It's, uh, right? And Basser points out in there as well, there's, it's basically castration. He says, There's nothing in Jewish uh, literature. Uh, that is a parallel to that, but he's, he's incorrect. There's nothing in rabbinic literature. The only uh, 
parallel you find that find to that in Jewish literature is in Fino. Hmm. Right? Where did he get it from? Right? Uh, it's Stoics. Right? It's a Stoic. It's an extreme. Uh, Stoics loved extremism, mm -hmm. right? To to make their point, to get their point across, to be extreme. Right, and so, uh, and you can show that it, it, even uh, when Jesus says, you know, not a jot or tittle, I think the King James says, you know, not, not one uh, part of the law will pass, right, till heaven and earth pass away. This actually, uh, if you look at the Greek, uh, you, you can see that the basic vocabulary, right, matches that uh, both Philo and Josephus, when they talk about the eternity of the Torah, right. Right. So, uh, to I think to a large extent, like the Sermon on the Mount, right? These are this is Stoic uh, principles of ethics, like loving your enemy, right? This is right out of Stoicism, but this is largely built on the the, eth the Stoic ethics of Philo, and um, uh, which is quite a a, a, a thought. Um, you know, because this is uh, Sermon on the Mount is supposed to be the greatest piece of uh, t teaching, right, of Jesus' teaching, and yet it's really informed by Philo's teaching. Uh, of course, Philo was born before Jesus, at least according to, you know, historical uh, uh, models, um, if accepting, you know, historicity of Jesus. Right. Um, so one could argue that, well, the historical Jesus actually assimilated some of Philo's teachings, right? But be that as it may, uh, the so-called highest ethics that you get in Christianity are, by all accounts, by Christian theologians, this is the Sermon on the Mount. But, but those highest elements there that are sometimes harder to trace in uh, pre-Christian Judaism are Stoic. <laughs> And, but of course, to a large extent, you can parallel just about everything in the Sermon on in the rabbinic literature because uh, the rabbinic literature also has integrated uh, uh, some Stoic uh, traditions, right? And, and why not? Right? Uh, there's no problem with that. Well, let me ask you this, because we're digging into Philo. I got to switch my picture so everybody can get this, feel the vibes of Philo with me, okay? Um, give me some connections before we get into one of the last comments you make about reconstructing the beliefs of Jesus and James. Um, what are some more connections between Philo and Paul, or really it's complicated to try and say exactly who used what in reality, because the gospels come later. We don't know what a historical Jesus on the ground may or may not have literally taught without trying to reconstruct something to try and consider maybe this is a possibility well, here without well, time machine you're not gonna go there <laughs> right and that's why i mean but i like to speculate and but um what can we know with the new testament texts that we know from philo that makes no sense except for a philo connection oh uh th th this is really uh probably too detailed right to talk about in a, in a, a medium like this, but okay. uh, I, I, I have written a, a monograph right, where I argue, and half of it's in Greek, because uh, I'm, I'm, I am making an argument that Paul does have access, direct access to some of Philo's writings. Some of them may be in a, like an anthology or a condensed abbreviated form, uh, but there's enough uh, uh, there Right, in the Greek of Philo and in Paul's Greek to be able to make a connection. But I do believe, and I make a, a case for this in, in, in this book uh, that I've written, it's not published yet. Uh, it's got a lot, uh, some good endorsements, I hope that will help, will help it get published. But uh, my basic argument is that Paul is, um, uh, is dependent on some of Philo's uh, writings and doctrines of course, he's, he is arguing against all of that. This, this is not his way of seeing things. But uh, that way of seeing things, the way of his opponents, is, is what James and the Jerusalem authorities, that's the way they saw things. Right? And what basically was that? In a nutshell, you can say that uh, Philo, I believe it's in uh, the Migration of Abraham, uh, that treatise, where uh, Philo criticizes some of his fellow Jews who uh, get lost, who go to extremes uh, in the allegorical interpretation of the Tanakh, 
to the point that say, well, well yeah, sim- uh, circumcision is symbolic, so we don't need to do it anymore. Right. He says, what you need to do is, yes, recognize that it is a symbolism involved, but uh, still you have to have the body and the soul, right? To be alive, you need the body and the soul. You need the physical circumcision and an appreciation of the spiritual symbolism of the physical act, right? And so uh, these are what he calls extreme allegorists. Now, this is what Paul was. He's arguing in Romans 2, uh, right, the real circumcision is circumcision of the spirit, right? Uh, so so this, is, uh, this is how you can put them into context. But Paul there uh, is arguing against, right, Philo's teachings. Hmm. Right, which were spreading in the 40s after his mission to Rome. Philo's teachings were spreading uh, in Rome and beyond, right? Because uh, it's very likely that even he taught in synagogues right, during the mission right, that he had in the early 40s from Alexandria, Egypt, to Rome. And so his teachings were spreading uh, in the local synagogues. And so some of these people that were in uh, you know, Paul's churches right, would have uh, been exposed to some of Philo's teachings right, in the synagogue, right? And uh, in, in any case, so uh, the James would have, uh, you know, f- f- uh, utilized Philo's teachings in his own mission, right? Uh, so you can put James and Philo together doctrinally, they would have seen things the same way. And I think James was actually right, using some of Philo's teachings, right? And Paul, and this is one of the reasons Paul is now polemicizing against some of these uh, uh, ideas that we see in Philo because they were being promoted by, by James and the Jerusalem authorities. They Jesus had enough story. in common to, to somehow be similar. Everything except, everything except uh, you know, the, the, the notion of the Messiah and the identification of the Messiah. But you see, even there, we're not uh, really sure about things because uh, James uh, was a Jew, just as uh, Jesus would have been a Jew, was not a Christian. Uh, We don't know. uh, We would presume that James actually didn't uh, believe that Jesus was the Messiah, rather that he believed that Jesus will be the Messiah. When he, when he, in his Perusia, when he returns and fulfills the Tanakh prophecies of what the Messiah is supposed to do, you know, wow. bring peace to the nations, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> this is probably what, you know, the Jerusalem authorities believe, right? Jesus is going to be the Messiah. So he's in, in an anticipatory, right, or a pro- proleptic sense is one of the fancy words, right, that's used. Uh, you can call him the Messiah by virtue of that, but he's really not the Messiah until he comes back and, and proves he, that this is what he is, right? By fulfilling the, the, all of the Tanakh prophecies, right? And so um, the, the other instance there would be, uh, the, the evidence really doesn't indicate that uh, James and, and uh, you know, those earliest uh, followers of Jesus would have believed in resurrection. They apparently believe apparently believe that Jesus uh, was raised alive, right, uh, from the cross, perhaps, uh, raised alive and ascended alive, like Enoch or Elisha. He was saved at the last moment and ascended alive, right? And uh, then, um, so, and certainly um, there were some, I think some uh, uh, Jewish followers of Jesus who, who interpreted his death uh, in the same way we see the, uh, Macca- the death of the Maccabean martyrs were interpreted in a, in a book like uh, Fourth Maccabees. That is, the martyr's death will purify the nation of Israel. But that's just a temporary purification. That has no implication, right, or, or no uh, uh, result. It doesn't result in the sacrificial system of the temple being abrogated. Right, so you, you, that goes on. So uh, they, they would have interpreted Jesus' death the same way as was Maccabean Martyr's death, not in the sense of, well, now he's the final sacrifice, we don't need any more, the sacrificial system right. in, uh, is dependent, none of that, no. Um, uh, they, they, uh, so they didn't, they didn't have uh, you know, the idea of uh, what Paul's idea- There's of, a combination of the- blood of Jesus, for instance. The logos being combined into this, I think, is where you would start to see a development of Christology that allows for a finality uh, 
sacrifice. I mean, that would be obviously uh, platonic and stoic, I would suspect, in, in nature as well, bringing uh, in the logos, uh, right? I'm not entirely sure what you're referring to, but I, uh, it, it does bring to mind immediately that uh, you know, Philo's teachings were, of course, then appropriated by Christians uh, in ways that uh, would have made him or makes him uh, turn over in the grave, uh, to, to use a phrase you always go Right. I, I guess uh, if you were comparing it to the uh, Maccabean situation, what I'm saying is, is if, if Jesus is a, a sacrifice, so to speak, like Fourth Maccabees describes the Maccabean uh, people, um, they kind of yeah, mythologized died. it. Died rather than renounce the law of Moses. Right. Uh, 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 so uh, you see the stark difference between that and Paul's theology. And uh, it's, uh, that, that, that's all I can say about that. It's, um, and later in the Epistle of the Hebrews, uh, as you were probably hinting at there, there's a platonic paradigm uh, that is, I think, utilizing some of Philo's teachings, but they're, they're appropriating them and, and turning, modifying them in ways that Philo would, would have been aghast uh, yeah. uh, um, <laughs> he, he was a Jew, a faithful Jew, uh, and um, that, that his writings could be used in the way that they were used by the church fathers is, is, uh, uh, is just, um, well, I, I don't know. <laughs> just, so what we, we need to read, what's the name of the monograph you wrote that goes into greater detail on Philo so that my audience can go check it out on Academia D yeah, it's not published yet. And uh, what is it? It's something like uh, uh, Philo and Paul, a reassessment, really short to, uh, to the point uh, title. And, um, um, well, in any case, you know, if, it, it, um, that, right, right. Um, I think it, you know, uh, and there's a whole literature, scholarly literature on Jewish Christianity. Right. And of course, there's a lot of debate and a lot of disagreement about how to reconstruct the beliefs of Jewish Christians. And of course, there were many different groups. Right. So you can't, they, they weren't monolithic. Right. And, uh, but, That's but the saying, most complicated part, Samuel. Is yeah, that but I'm you saying, can't in, general, put... right, in general, if you want to know what James and Jesus believed, right, of course, with all necessary qualifications, right, uh, you, you just make a list of uh, the beliefs and the practices of Paul's opponents. Go through his letters and write uh, these things down and you'll start to see a pattern. And, and, and so um, you have to wonder, all right, if James uh, is in control of that movement, he's at the head of the movement uh, in Jerusalem and Cephas is there and presumably others who had been disciples of Jesus, who've known Jesus, um, how could you go for decade after decade with uh, th those disciples of Jesus living with James if what James was standing for and teaching was totally opposed to what Jesus had taught? Mm. So uh, I think that uh, 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 an accurate the best we can do at reconstructing what the historical Jesus is, uh, that's what I believe in, the historical Jesus would have taught uh, would be to look at James. So he would have been uh, uh, Torah faithful, right? And he would probably have a reputation, right? For being, yes, a stickler uh, for, for, uh, for the Torah, right? And uh, presumably died uh, for it. Um, in a certain sense, but uh, which is which is you know one of the grand historical ironies. <laughs> um, well, it, in any case, um, right? Paul, uh, at least one of the Deuteropoly, yeah, Paul and the Deuteropoline writings. You can read points like, well, to those who are pure, all things are pure. So go ahead and eat what you want to eat. Right, and so this is uh, this is what Jesus teaches in the Gospels. So this this is just Paul's doctrine being put into Jesus' mouth. Uh, the the real Jesus, right? If we we can go by everything that we can reconstruct historically about Judaism at that time, and especially Pharisaic like uh, rabbis, they would have spent their time uh, talking about points of halakha, 
right, and Kashrut and things like this. Uh, it would have been about the law of Moses. But of course, they were living in turbulent times, right? And so there, were, there were, was a problem with uh, false messianic claimants who were messiahs. Uh, fomenting rebellions against the empire, and so the whole his, the whole story of Jesus, right, is imbricated uh, in that uh, history uh, uh, of t tension, right, uh, between Jewish autonomy uh, uh, and the, the uh, Roman authorities, right, and so of course Jesus is uh, arrested and crucified, right, for sedition. Right, and what kind of Jesus is this? Is this a rebel? Yes, yes. You know, I mean, and, and, and you know, you, you. I mean, others have written eloquently on this, and you know, in, in, in a lot of detail. No, I mean, there there are enough sayings. That, you know, what, what do you mean? I didn't come for to bring peace to the world. I came to bring a sword, right? And it says, well, if you have clubs, let's sell it and get a get a sword. Well, we got two swords here. Well, that's enough, yeah. Uh, so there, there's more than just the peace thing there. Right uh, in, in the in the in the gospel, Jesus. Um, but I mean, th this is uh, I don't know why it upsets uh, you know some some people uh, because <laughs> this is a thoroughly uh, Jewish uh, messianic model. It takes I mean, away the magic. Model. It takes away their magic. That's all it is. And it, in it, the Second Temple uh, Jewish literature, the Messiah is a military figure, right? And he he's. Uh, you know, that, that's what it is in the Janata, that's what it is in the Psalm of Solomon number 17, for instance. It's, it's a military messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it, he's a king after all, right? Uh, according to uh, right, traditional interpretations of some of the Tanakh prophecies, like Isaiah 11. He, he, he's a royal figure who, who's uh, also, you know, therefore by definition a military leader, right? And uh, so th there's uh, there's nothing disrespectful. There's nothing blasphemous in pointing something like that and, and uh, seeing uh, Jesus as some kind of seditious figure. Uh, for, if you look at Josephus, that's the implication. Uh, w whatever one might believe about the uh, the, the testimonium Flavianum, uh, whatever he, he actually said there about Jesus is sandwiched between uh, all of these discourses right. about Good point. seditious behavior. Uh, uh, among Jews at that time. And then right in the middle of it, there's, he talks about Jesus. So, so and, let me ask uh, you a final question. And this is like, uh, this is a big question, but it's a good question, I think, to end this show with and, and cliffhang on. Maybe we have to do a show touching on this at some point um, in the future. But why would it, Paul, who has this radically different uh, take, you know, absolutely spiritualizing Torah, uh, really almost abrogating it completely, giving a new law. Um, why is he concerned about this Jesus guy? I mean, Jesus already has followers who take him at a, in a totally different way. What, what would, I guess this is really reading into something we don't really have enough evidence of, but maybe you can give me your opinion. Like, what would make him look and go, this guy recently died. His followers um, believe he really rose from the dead. He himself had a real possible experience. And was he already part of the earlier movement and broke off and decided to, hey, we're wrong. And I need to, I need to, to convince, I need to change this. There's a, there's a different, there's the truth is not what they've been following and made his own thing. Or what would make him be attracted to this messianic, rebel rebel who's a seditious follower you know who, who who's opposing rome what would attract him to this guy uh, the idea of him rising from the dead he was convinced by their followers yeah, uh, anyone who tries to answer it is just uh you know involved in speculation right but, you know, we uh, people humans like to speculate and, but uh yeah it's it's an entire topic uh, to itself but i would say briefly uh one thing to keep in mind uh when you start off on that topic is is to recognize right, that the uh, accounts in acts of paul's uh, conversion this is on the road to damascus and all of this have been in correctly or inaccurately read into the Epistle of Galatians account of Paul's revelation that he received uh, from Jesus. Okay. Right. So in, in other words, what I'm saying is, if you put two and two together there, 
uh, and in fact, there's a chapter on this in, uh, I believe it's a fest shrift, I forget the title of it, but I believe it's a fest shrift dedicated to Dennis McDonald, actually. There, there is a chapter in there uh, by a scholar, I forget his name, but he does point out this, this, uh, this methodological error. But the gist of it is this. It, uh, Paul apparently would have been within the Jesus movement and, and following the James version for some time. And after a period of time of already following Jesus, he then had his revelation about his particular gospel. And that's when he broke with the movement, right? So the, the, the key to this is you have to, you, have to, you have to keep in mind that Acts, you cannot be read uh, uh, to, as historically as the Galatians can. Right. So you can't read Acts into Galatians. Uh, once you get rid of that, then you can reconstruct. It is possible that, that Paul was a part of the Jesus movement for quite some time uh, of the persuasion of James. And that, that some at some point there came a break. Uh, uh, which repeated, would make which revelation. would make if you don't mind me mentioning, Sam, it would make a lot of sense because I mean, if you do take Galatians at face value and you consider like thinking just basic common sense questions why are they giving this guy a time or day why does he even have a gospel that these guys would even consider hearing what he has to say it's like dude we were part of this originally you are nobody a part of this original movement well, like he's having a lot of success right and, among so he he's, he's some someone uh that has to be dealt with right uh has to be understood right uh he just can't be totally ignored and that's the thing. Another thing is, is is speculative on my part, but I think it also makes sense is that they're talking to him, even if they're not dealing with him yet. If, if Paul's correct in saying they met with him, uh, it's probably because they knew of him. Um, and it, it wasn't just some random guy out of nowhere who had a strange revelation of a character that he's never even known about. Even if he never met him in person, he didn't know about him. No, I'm, I'm, it would make sense that he comes from this movement that he was even given a chance uh, in light of uh, the conversation that, oh, they broke the contract and all that. Well, maybe they didn't really have a contract or maybe they lied and said, I don't know. Uh, perhaps, but uh, I would say the stronger reason right, would be when he had, uh, he was having a lot of success. Right? And so just on a pastoral level, yeah, they, they're going to have to keep track of, of this man and, and what he's doing. Uh, right. So, but uh, in any case, it's probably the subject for movies and historical novels and all this more than uh, because of it. It's, it's next to impossible to really have much confidence about questions like this. And, and ultimately, yeah. I mean, inner experiences that, that people have of a religious nature or whatever, I mean, that, that just beyond historical recovery and, and I'm with you 100%. Samuel Zinner, thank you so much for joining me on the show, my friend. I really appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. It's my, my pleasure. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want you guys to go down in the description. Check out what we have down there. You guys can help support the show, help us grow, become a patron. You get early access to everything. Who knows what kind of tricks or treats I might have for you guys in the future. Right now, it's early access to everything I edit. And when it's edited and it's up, everything from the Mormon series, you name it. I've got a list of different series that I'm putting out and constantly doing videos you guys get early access to. Also, check out Samuel Zenner's links. He's got a lot. He's written a lot. You guys can tell he's read a lot, written a lot, and he's familiar with this material inside out. He's uh, acquainted with all the arguments from various schools of thought. I really want to know your guys' thought on the discussion today. What do you think about Paul within Judaism? What do you think about what he brought up today? I mean, we weren't even making this show about that, really. It wasn't even a poke at Paul within Judaism uh, show, which could be a show within itself taking apart the arguments really one by one. But I want your guys' thoughts hit that like button hit the subscribe button hit the bell so you're notified every time i drop something out there you guys can get first access to it and i want you guys to email me with your questions and ideas and thoughts you can get early access to those videos like i said on patreon but you can also uh, private message me for private conversation and maybe some thoughts that you have by becoming a patron and so with that being said if you've already forgotten and usually i hear that people don't forget but i keep saying this just in case you do we 
are Myth Vision.